I'd like to call this resource committee to meet him together, please, at uh, 4 20. Would you do the invitation for us, please? You all rise. You rise. Put your hands. And Lord, thank you for giving us another opportunity to get together and do the business of the Cherokee people. Please help us find the wisdom to do that business. And as we do that, please help us remember and take care of the least among us. Amen. Okay. Roll call, Shelley. Curtis Mel? Here. Bill England? Here. Jack Baker? Here. Julia Coates? Here. Jody Fishing Hawk? Here. Meredith Bailey? Here. Janelle Fulbright? Here. Don Garvin? On a... Chuck Hoskin Jr. Here. Tyler Glory Jordan? Where is it? Lee Keener. Oh, Lee. Dick Lay. Here. David Thornton. Here. David Walking Stick. <coughs> Kara Callen Wong. Honey. John Masters. Who? We do have a quorum. Moving on down, I'd like approval of the November 14th regular session. So moved. Second. Second. <coughs> Any questions? All approved? Aye. 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 All opposed? <clears throat> Moving on down to reports, uh, Pat Gwynn. Pat, we will just uh, take questions from your uh, written reports. Yes, I've got, you have my report package and I have a presentation for later, so I'm here to if you have any questions to answer those for you. So, have any questions for Pat? Now the written reports. Okay. Yes, sir. Next is uh, Real Estate Services, Linda Donaldson. Good afternoon, Linda Donaldson. I'm here to answer your questions. I believe you have my, my report in your package. And I do want to add that we did get a property in the trust on November 28th. And it was 10 acres uh, that was formerly the Cherokee Nation Bingo Outpost, Inc. It's uh, at Roland, and it is uh, 10 acres that is a parking lot for the truck stop. Mm -hmm. So uh, that went to trust on the November 28th. So uh, this one we've been working on for the last 10 years. So we were glad to see that it happened. And I do owe some people some information on railroads. I haven't forgotten. I just hadn't got it all packaged up, and you will be getting that. Any <laughs> <laughs> questions for Linda? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next is the environmental program, Tom Elkins. Good afternoon, sir. Okay. I hope you have a copy of our report. Uh, I think all of our uh, goals are going on quite uh, the way we wanted them to. Uh, you'll see on uh, part C there a radon test. We're at zero. We've just bought some radon tests for Cherokee Nation citizens. We don't, we don't have a radon program like we did in the past. The match for that through uh, the EPA is 50%. And we can buy these tests and give them to our citizens much cheaper than fooling with the EPA and having to jump through their hoops, so we just do it on our own. Uh, but we haven't, to date, we haven't getting, given any of those out. Uh, everything else seems uh, just going on about uh, the way we had planned it. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Tina Gory Jordan has, has asked us about, uh, about looking into uh, CNG or compressed natural gas vehicles throughout the nation. Uh, and I haven't done that with the nation reorg, as Chief Baker is going to do that, obviously. But um, uh, I did notice that uh, through an email that our uh, the person who handles the GSAs identified that um, uh, GSA is going to be providing Honda Civic vehicles to GSA. And I know our office is looking at getting one, and I know that there were other offices that wanted to do that. I don't know to the extent right now. But, and those can be purchased, but through GSA, they can get those right now, and they're looking at 
getting uh, some other kinds of pickups. And so if we can get some of those, I think we'll be well on our way. The, uh, all the equipment is in over there except for the card reader. And I believe that's something that uh, Cherokee Nation Entertainment is working out with their vendors. So all the equipment's there and working. It's been tested. The only thing holding that up is the card reader. And they say they'll have that by the within a week or two. And that's what we have. Any questions for Tom? Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yes, sir. Move down to old business. I see none. And down to new business. The resolution authorizes submission of a special <coughs> grant application from the U.S. Department of Interior, Energy, and Mineral Development Program. Sponsor David Gordon. Yes. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm really excited about this program. I'm excited for my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, and my great-great-grandchildren. Because I think this will have a bearing on them over the years. And uh, I was probably, I was the only one that went down into Arkansas and looked over a generation plant uh, along with uh, uh, Ms. Watt was there, several others, but uh, this plant was really impressive. It's been there for a number of years. I uh, had three generation <coughs> generators on here. Uh, it's generating from 10 to 12 million dollars a year, and it could possibly generate even up to 15 if it was turned loose, I imagine, or even more. But uh, the thing about this is, is uh, before we talk, before I talk any more, I want to say that this is uh, whereas that the Council of Cherokee Nation hereby authorizes the Chief Executive Officer of the Cherokee Nation Business LLC to apply for grant funding from the U.S. Department of Interior, <coughs> Energy, and Miners Development Program to conduct any <coughs> studies or assessments necessary for the WD Mayo side of the Arkansas Riverbed, including engineering and marketing for pre-construction development of hydroelectric <coughs> facility for possible economic development and distribute uh, generation purposes and authorize these studies to be conducted with all tribal staff and our private contractors, consultants. And uh, What this actually is covering is, is this started phase three? Or this phase is phase four. This phase well, four. Well, the grant application will be phase five. We just got funding for phase four. Phase four, okay. Uh, this is funding that will take in phase four of this. We will allow funding for U.S. Corps of Engineers, detailed firehouse uh, model study, and uh, movable bed uh, model. So what I understand is they have to make a model of this before they can continue due to the Corps of Engineers. Is that right? And I, I did uh, learn quite a bit by going down there at least. He did, uh, I, I really appreciate what uh, Carol has done. And she's done it, and this will help our nation uh, tremendously in the next hundred years. And, uh, I would like to put this into a form of a motion. Second. Passed by the council. <clears throat> this motion. Is grant. Second. Any questions? And will that be brought to tonight's uh, and council meeting? I would also meeting. like to bring this forward to the full council tonight to pass. Yes. yes. Uh, Ms. Redrick, yes. just a comment. Uh, my understanding is this is going to be coming into phase five, and uh, it really all started in 1986 and uh, the first uh, uh, known WD Mayo hydro project. And uh, it's been a long time, but it's getting pretty close. I understand that uh, if we, everything goes right, they'll start <coughs> and uh, we'll get this 
a phase five grant that could start building and it could be completed by uh, 12, uh, 2015, which would be uh, about three years from now. And uh, it's going to bring in lots of money. And as long as that river continues to go downhill, we're going to run out for the next hundred years. And uh, as everyone knows, water runs downhill. And uh, my understanding is they have to do one tune up after about 46 years on the uh, generator. And it kind of goes back to the idea of this old water wheel, you know, that uh, used to grind that corn, and we get the energy off of that, and that water goes over this generator, <coughs> makes electricity, and uh, it's going to mean 10 to 12 million uh, a year for the Cherokee people, and uh, all we got to do is sell that electricity, and we're in. But uh, I recommend everybody vote for it and uh, keep your fingers crossed. I think it's a good deal for our people and it's going to work. <coughs> Thank you. Some good, good news today. They, um, uh, our consultants went to meet with Western Farmers and they're very in interested in buying the power. In fact, they're, they're really ready to do a power purchase agreement, except we're not quite to the stage. But they wanted us to lock in um, with them and not um, check on anybody else. And so uh, that's good news, but we made a lot of progress today on the power purchase agreement. So Western Farmers, they're the electric co-op in the area. And it can produce a lot more money than that, but this is a 100-year project. Yes, uh, this also is going to bring uh, quite a bit of income over the next three or four years to uh, Sequoia County and uh, Muskogee County and anyone that comes down there to work. They're supposed to work 150 <coughs> to 200 people in that area. Uh, it's, you know, it's going to generate the employment uh, of Sequoia County up and it's probably the uh, highest low income uh, County in the, in the state of Oklahoma right now. It has been graded that I think two months ago. Uh, this could bring to even to our community, you know, uh, a local economic benefit of five and five hundred and thirty-two million dollars. And man, that's just that'd be great for our area. But the thing about this is they're going to uh, eventually work probably close to 10 highly trained workers uh, at this local area. And uh, of course, that, that, that is a gross income of 10 to $12 million. But uh, it's just uh, a, a energy that you know that is a green energy <coughs> that's provided for, for the Cherokee Nation to benefit from. And when I look out over that river now, uh, I see dollar signs going down that river. So. You need, <laughs> need to really think about this because it's going to help us. And, and I really don't believe that this is going to be the only one that the Cherokee Nation <coughs> is endeavored in. Uh, that's my belief. I believe we will probably go up the river. And this is the first stop. And that's, that's what I believe and what I would push you know, while I'm on this council. And... Uh, I'm proud to, to to be on this council at this time because this is a business that you really don't have to worry that much about. You're going to to receive funding over this. It's going to cost you $140 million to build this thing, but it, you're going to be able to get the money real easy and be able to pay it off pretty easy. So uh, I think we can get it at a very low interest. And I'm... I'm high on this, but of course you know it's my area, but it wouldn't make any difference what area it was in if it, if it was in uh, uh, Catoosa or if it was in Muskogee or, or going on up the river to, to uh, uh, Wagner or any of those places. Uh, I think this is a great, great deal, and, and I'm proud to be a part of it. Thank you. One thing that helped sell him on that was because he got to go to the site. And the site at Fort Smith is, our, our project will almost exactly mirror that one. And so we were able to get the economics off of theirs and everything else. But to be able to see that exactly, 
that it's a real good visual. So if any of you want to do that as a group, we can arrange that sometime. It's, uh, it helps. Another thing is, pardon me, folks. Yes. Uh, they can take a person and take a laptop and control that site and do about anything they want to there. Uh, the thing is, the Corps of Engineers keeps them from generating so many days a year, but I think they're going to have a hard time with the Cherokee Nation trying to keep them from generating because, uh, you know, we own that riverbed. And uh, I, think, I think that's another asset that we have there. Uh, thank you. Are there more questions? Yes. Uh, Councilman Thornton, mm -hmm. uh, this is a this is a grant, right? That's that's funding this. The one hundred forty four million. Yeah, it's a. Uh, on this Let me get over this here. is a grant application for just a portion of mm -hmm. the project. What, what the total portion? project is about one hundred forty four million, what but we'll probably get. For? About um, one to two million dollars. One to two million dollars. So, and this may be our last time to be able to get grant funds on this project. How are we going to supplement the 142 million? Well, we will finance it when we get to that point. And Cherokee have, Nation. Yes, Cherokee Nation businesses with the approval of the okay. board and the council. And it's expected to, I guess, get 500. And $32 million uh, of profit, is that, is that correct? No, that's just how it will affect the economy oh, in that area okay. over a period of years. Is that 2 to $12 million in? 10 to 12 is a minimum. We expect a, lar a larger amount than that. We don't have the actual determination yet because we don't have the cost of the turbines. and uh, But we do have, when we get the power purchase agreement, which we just about you know, we have a company that's wanting to buy all the power, then the rest of it is easy. So we can get about, it financed. So it'll be about 14 years to, to pay off, or maybe a little longer to pay it off could the debt. Be. But and, it's a 100 year project. Yeah, and we have to get a um, someone to purchase the electricity from us. Yes, and Western Farmers stated very definitely today that they want to buy the power. Oh, they, we they have they're... others that are interested too, but Western Farmers is the electric co-op in that area, and yes, they do want to buy the power. Okay. Our we just don't have a signed power purchase agreement yet, but we made a lot of progress today on that. Okay. You, yes, sir. you can go ahead and tell him that the chop calls want the power too. <laughs> <laughs> the chop calls too. <laughs> Looks like we're going to need an auctioneer to auctioneer it off at the top price. Yeah. Any more questions? Mr. Chair? Yes. Would the councilman take any more co-sponsors on this resolution? Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah Anybody else want to sponsor this with the uh, best of sponsors? If, you, if the council would add me, I'd be appreciative. Who won the vote? Anybody not Anybody want not to? Anybody not want to sponsor? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good job. I'd be loving it. You did a good work. Oh. Okay, we're ready to uh, have a vote on this. All in favor of this resolution, give me an eye sign. Mr. Chairman, this sir, needs to go to the council tonight also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the council. Ms. Shelley can take care of that. Thank you, Mr. Council. Okay, thank you. Yes, Jack. Mr. Chair, since Carol White is here today, <coughs> with your permission, I'd like to ask for a brief report on the wind project. We're going to have to cut them real short because we've got a fresh session here. I was supposed to have a 45-minute time frame for the presentation that Pat Gwynn's been preparing for three months today. So, we've already requested for a short update. Okay. okay. Two we minutes. Two minutes. We just about have a power purchase on the wind, too. And when we get that, we could be we could have the wind farm built by the end of the year. And that's good news. End of 2012. End of 2012, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, a couple weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where, where would this be built? Oh, 
This is at Shilako. Uh, I think we have 4,000 acres up there, and it's on the portion that's the 2,600 acres. And we have a developer that's helping us to, we've turned it over to a developer, and that's Peony Wind and Andre DeRosa is with me here today. You just happen to be here. And so, uh, anyway, it's just exciting. It looks like it's going to go also. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's always windy. Mm -hmm. Are you ready to do your presentation? Yes, sir. I'm going to get this uh, uh, projector gen up. <coughs> Before you get too uh, apprehensive, the presentation is uh, uh, 60 slides long, but I can go through this really quickly. <laughs> if I can type without my glasses. Did you want to introduce this or? So, I don't know where our chair went. Oh, okay, Mr. Chair. Yes. So just briefly, so we had asked Pat Wynn, uh, Councilman Keener, and I are very interested in our. In if you have anything to add, and we're done. Just the the honey or the gathering policies on traditional gathering practices in particular, <laughs> but when you start delving into it, our forestry. Our Bureau of Indian Affairs Forestry Plan and a lot of other things and our current policy on how we lease out properties and such, those all impact so it's much more involved and uh, we would like a comprehensive reform uh, and look at these things and probably put some of the policies into law to protect the interest <coughs> of our tribal citizens who still gather in a traditional manner. So. And that's what, this is an intro to what we do today. This is an intro to that, and I apologize for the, the nerdiness of the presentation, but this is the stuff that I really enjoy doing. So, uh, as I said, my apologies in advance. Uh, but as, as Kara stated, uh, uh, we have emailed back and forth about the need for a gathering rights policy on tribal lands. Uh, and. There has been several small pieces of legislation policy in the past that have all failed because I really and truly believe we need to take a very comprehensive approach to our tribal lands egress and ingress policies uh, to get this to work. Uh, I think the most important thing to take away from today's presentation is, is that number one, we have a continuing, continuing decrease, a, a decreasing land base. Uh, Maybe not numerically, but, it's, but definitely statistically, because as we get more folks, we're going to continue to spread out our land thinner and thinner. So uh, I want to, uh, as I said, do, the, do the, the somewhat nerdy thing and go back. And I know some of this is, uh, is, is common knowledge, but I think it's important to realize that uh, you know, we come from 256 million acres back east. Uh, after removal, you know, we, had the, uh, we have the tribal treaty area and the Cherokee outlet. After the infamous uh, Treaty of 1866, we were uh, left with what most of us recognize as the 14-county area of the Cherokee Nation, which, by the way, was three, uh, about 3.1 million acres. Today, if you can look at this map, uh, you're looking at about 47,000 acres. In the top, uh, the tribal land is represented by the, uh, the red polygons. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, that is Shilako. If you look at the largest red blob uh, in Delaware County, that is the Kenwood Project, which I'll explain later. If you look in uh, Southern Adair County, that is the Candy Mink Springs Project. And, and I will explain these projects later. And I said, uh, this is basically what uh, we have at this point in time. This, and this, by the way, is not what's left from the 3.1 million acres. Uh, that's a wives' tale. We had nothing left, basically, from the 3.1 million acres. 
the projects that I mentioned, Candy Mink Springs, Yonkers, Sequoia, Kenwood, those were actual, uh, th that's legislation that in the 30s and 40s authorized the federal government to buy back lands for the Cherokee Nation. Just some uh, rough statistics. All of this is in front of you. Uh, not the meat of the presentation, but wanted you to have this. This is just the acres by county. Uh, you see the, the trust acreage, some of the fee acreage. And uh, these are not going to be exact because Linda keeps changing these figures on me daily. Uh, and, uh, uh, but they're really close. Land use patterns. Uh, as you can see, the vast majority is agricultural, uh, followed very closely by idle forest lands. And uh, I know that uh, some of us are more in tune with, uh, with, uh, with tribal lands than others. I, for one, have probably been on almost every tract of tribal land we have. But every day I receive, or Natural Resources receives calls, where can I, and I'm just going to go through a series of slides, what people want to do. This is first for a reason, and I'll get to that reason later, but everybody knows the importance of deer hunting for the Cherokees, both historically, culturally, and uh, due to uh, sustenance issues today. Turkey hunting, <coughs> I want you to pay close attention to the next two slides, rabbit hunting, uh, rabbits and squirrels. Uh, hunting, always a big deal, and uh, uh, like I said, I want to get to that later because it's somewhat of a bit of misinformation. Another large category is people come to us and say, I need X plant for X reason. Uh, and uh, the plants that you see here, oh, I'm sorry, that's, uh, by the way, ginseng. Uh, one day I'd like to give my uh, cultural plant presentation to the crowd, but I won't do, won't do that today. Uh, this is... Uh, um, just to say one more nerdy thing, this is the most important plant to the Cherokees. Uh, uh, culturally, it was used in most of our formulas. This is golden seal, closely related to ginseng and its use. This is the rarest plant in Oklahoma. This is uh, red root, prairie willow, salix humulus. You can't start a stomp dance without this plant. Rattlesnake master. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, so those, the plants I just showed you were, for the most part, cultural. The plants I'm going through now, these are medicinal. This is uh, uh, Sweet Everlasting. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, Green Dragon. Uh, those are some medicinal plants. <clears throat> this is Bloodroot. Uh, this causes a very large amounts of fights on tribal land because Bloodroot, of course, is used by our basket weavers for the dye. And uh, Bloodroot's a very sensitive plant. You dig it up wrong and it never comes back again. River cane. This is uh, shagbar kickery. Uh, Osage orange. Uh, all of those are trees that uh, every day we have requests for folks to be able to cut those trees down because they need them for arts and crafts use. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, now I'm getting into some uh, some just some sustenance food items. Uh, this is sassafras. Huckleberries, we've had tribal members thrown in jail over this plant because of where they're picking. Wild onions, everyone in here is well versed with wild mm -hmm. onions. We have uh, uh, wishy, the mushrooms we have. And then uh, one of the things I've noticed over the last several years is the, num the amount of requests we have from our citizens that they want to go see something. And, uh, and I will get into those with my later statistics. So all of those and hundreds of things more were asked to uh, were asked, hey, where can I go get these as a tribal citizen? And uh, as I said, we're, look, we're dealing with 47,000 acres. If you look at most of those things, most of those are sensitive plants, animals from the forest. So you're cut down to about 17,000 acres. And as I said, those lands were, uh, were purchased for us in the 30s and 40s. This is the Kenwood Project. It's about 17,000 acres. Uh, interesting thing to note how we own land underneath uh, Lake Uchi. This is the Candy Mink Springs, Candy Mink Springs Project, uh, Southern Adair County, and that line down there is Sequoia County. So you see uh, Candy Mink Springs Project did extend a little bit into uh, northern Sequoia County. This is South Salt Creek Park, Adair, uh, Sequoia County, 800 acres. 
This is uh, the Rocky Ford uh, project. It's uh, about 270 acres up in uh, Cherokee County, of course, up at Rocky Ford. Uh, a bit of a note, I, most people misspell Rocky Ford. They, they always do it as two words with a capital F, it's one. Uh, this is the Sequoia Project, another federally funded project from the 40s. Uh, it's the land that we're sitting on right here. This is Shalako, 4,000 acres out in Kay County, uh, north of Newkirk and Ponca City. Uh, some of this in trust, and I think, Linda, you're getting the rest of this place in trust. Yeah, so. Uh, and this is also where the uh, wind farm that they just discussed is going. Uh, one of the things that uh, natural resources do just for your constituents is uh, everything you've seen and, 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 and scores more, we keep uh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty specific uh, geographic documentation on where those can be found. Uh, so if, you, if folks need help finding those things, if they'll contact us, we can certainly get them through there. So that brings me to care to the meat of, of, of where we are. The tribe has never had a written policy on how you get on tribal lands to hunt, how you get on tribal lands to gather. Uh, and that's caused an awful lot of consternation in the past. Historically, uh, the tribe, and historically and verbally, it's just simply been tribal citizenship required. Uh, which, by the way, that did not transfer to your family. You actually had to have a blue card. So, uh, And uh, <clears throat> notice how the uh, historical stance was walk-in only. No four-wheelers, no horses, no mountain bikes, and then no commercial, no commercial use. Uh, and, of course, you throw in, uh, we do have uh, some fairly specific lease policies for agricultural. Uh, we have no hunting, land, hunting leases on tribal lands per se. We have some tribal lands in Stevens <coughs> County. Is that our only hunting lease, hunting lease Linda, the Stevens County lease? Well, there's one in Texas. Texas. Yeah, but uh, the lands around here we don't lease for hunting. Those, that's for our tribal citizens' use. And I believe, Linda, has, you still have a few rec uses, like CMS 33. Yes. Yeah, so a few recreational uses, but for the most part, our leases are all agricultural. This is where it begins to get somewhat convoluted because we have the Cherokee Nation Hunting and Fishing Code and it, by tribal law, states who can come on land and who is allowed to perform certain functions on land. And uh, uh, the code exists, but there were never any regulations uh, to uh, formalize or to add to the code. So as of right now, a tribal member can go hunt on tribal lands property. However, if he has a non-tribal family member, that person cannot go and, and hunt deer with them. The person cannot go and gather wild onions with them, cannot go and, uh, and just simply hike on the property. Uh, as Kara stated, we have a forest management plan, which, uh, uh, not to start fights here, but the BIA claims ownership of the tribe's forest resources. Uh, and that's, that's, that's been their historical stance. So we don't, we don't ask permission to cut our trees, we're asking permission to cut their trees. Uh, and uh, in the next few months I will be bringing a new forest management plan back to this committee uh, and I'll, I'll bring you up on the history of that as well. Uh, we have the integrated resource management plan, which by the way would solve a lot of problems if we could just get uh, the IRMP uh, drafted, approved, and uh, enacted. But at this point in time, we don't have that. With those, you also have the fire management plan, which, all, which is also federally mandated. You have the agricultural management plan. Numerous, numerous Department of Interior laws, rules, and regulations governing this. Then uh, we have some archaic language in some of our uh, older statutes that uh, just general resource protection laws, uh, about cutting trees, about uh, getting rock and dirt from tribal lands. Nothing, uh, nothing comprehensive. In uh, the last uh, eight years, there have been several attempts to do not a tribal gathering rights plan, but a recreation plan. And uh, some of those plans actually made it into written form. Uh, none took traction because 
once they were looked at, they noticed that they were conflicting with other federal legislation, other uh, tribal legislation. So none of them really gained traction. Uh, the latest draft was uh, a compilation of a couple of earlier drafts, and it was actually fairly specific and uh, hit on a, a number of, uh, of different areas that if you look at these areas, hunting and fishing, traditional foods, arts and crafts, medicinal, spiritual, uh, a lot of these are the things that uh, some of the council members have been saying, hey, we need to legislate. Uh, and it also went into the developed uh, the developed parts of it. One of the things that intrigued me about this was the, the 2010 draft was it had a, a section on short-term objectives and long-term objectives. And as I studied those with uh, due to CARES request and some, <coughs> other, uh, some other requests from administration, I, there is some low-hanging fruit as far as uh, possible resources to further uh, recreational or tribal lands usage development. And I want to talk about that, but talk about that later. Uh, but as I said, uh, the recreation plan was intended to stand on its own. And uh, once it, once it, there was so much conflict found with the other uh, uh, rules, regulations, and authorities, it was just dropped. In the middle of, uh, well, about the spring of this year, with the help of uh, GeoData, we put up a. Uh, Natural Resources put up a, uh, a survey for, uh, on our website say to, to our citizens, how do you want us to utilize your tribal lands? And the re uh, say we have 328 respondents to, as of today. I think we had a little over 400. The percentages are remaining pretty close to the same. But as you can look at from some of these percentages, 93% engage in outdoor activities. Obviously, if you're, if you're responding to a recreation uh, survey, you're probably going to do that. So that's not, uh, that's not surprising. 49% use Cherokee Nation lands. That was a much higher number than what I thought. The biggest number in there was that, uh, and I can give you uh, the results of this survey. And like I said, it's online if you want them. But 97% wanted the tribe to do more recreational development. 83% uh, want such development to be free use for citizens and fee for non-citizens. The interesting point about that percentage is that about, uh, Tom, when did we do the hunting and fishing uh, community meetings? About five, six years ago? About five, six years ago, <coughs> that, uh, 80, that was the same thing that, that came about in the hunting and fishing uh, surveys. So as we go through these activities on what these folks are doing and want to do, that's when the surprises hit. Because to go back to the deer, I've been here for 20 years and everything that the tribe has ever done on our tribal lands has been for deer hunting. Well, our tribal members want to deer hunt. <coughs> and uh, as you can see from the data up there, we're, we're actually not, we may be expending more energy than what uh, our people want. By far, fishing was the, was the largest category in the hunting and fishing. Small game, higher than uh, large game. So of those folks that hunted, excuse me, of those Cherokee Nation citizens that hunted, only 33% of them were involved in deer hunting. So uh, to me, that was an eye opener. Uh, you go to the gathering, 28% for sustenance, the medicinal and arts and crafts. That shouldn't have been together, but it was really hard to separate, 26%. Uh, as I said, 100% of our management activities historically have been towards large game. Uh, the other eye opener was on the camping, which by the way is verbally prohibited on tribal lands with the exception of South Salt Creek Park, of course. But tent camping was the second most requested uh, activity that folks wanted to do, 65%. Uh, and then we listed several forms of camping from tent to uh, uh, you know, to RV hookups, I mean RVs without hookups all the way to hookups and everything. So that's why that scales like that. Hiking, another very, very high percentage of folks that uh, we've expended zero activity for. The other eye opener was on the off-road activities, always expressively forbidden. Uh, horseback scored very high. Uh, ATVs, motorcycles, uh, mount, uh, four by fours. Uh, mountain bikes, I mean, you can see. Uh, so to me, the data shows that 
with the camping, the, hor the horseback riding, and some of the off-road activities are things that if we want to engage our tribal people on our tribal <coughs> lands, we're going to have to do more towards. So to get back on to CARES topic, I didn't forget you, uh, I think we can split our activities up into cultural, which is what you see there, the fishing, hunting, and gathering. I mean, fishing, fish, hunting and fishing, gathering for sustenance and arts and crafts. And uh, recreational. Once again, fishing and hunting, uh, there is, it's a fine line to draw there, but uh, I could explain it both ways. Camping, uh, hiking, horseback riding, and off-highway vehicle usage. Uh, before you can write just exactly a comprehensive plan on, on this activity, you have to also realize there are other issues involved, particularly in uh, our Delaware, uh, our Kenwood, and our Candy Mink Springs projects. We have lots of federal lands intertwined with those. Those are national wildlife refuges. Uh, you could possibly do memorandums of agreements to try to get them to agree with what you want to do. State lands will be harder, but uh, up in Kenwood, we had our tribal members thrown in jail because they go on to the state game refuges to pick uh, huckleberries for the Huckleberry Festival. So uh, it's a big deal. And as I said, continually increasing population, decreasing land base. Now, most of the, the land base does decrease mostly in the restricted, well, basically the restricted component, but uh, still more people, the land stays pretty static. So my point number one, uh, I think that you have to actively encourage tribal citizens to use tribal lands. And please read the first bullet. That's, uh, I think it's, it's the most important part of the presentation. If we don't use them, we're going to forget them. Uh, in Adair County particularly, we have uh, probably a third of our land that's inaccessible due to landlocked issues. Uh, last month, uh, we were able to buy, purchase 113 acres that opened up 813 acres. We still have a lot more of that to go. Uh, but the lands that we do not actively use, we will have, we will have continual trespass issues on them, and we will have continual, uh, uh, we'll just forget them. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, it's, it's somewhat sad to say that out of this room, I'm probably the only person that's been on half the tribal land in here. And like I said, I've, I think I've been on every piece of it, but if we don't use it, we're going to lose it. Uh, I strongly believe that we need a legislative vehicle for this. Uh, uh, it, yes, it could be it could be policy only, but I believe that uh, uh, some in order to engage our federal and state partners, we're going to have to have some have some type of legislative authority from the council. Uh, all means adoption, uh, and I think we're going to have to uh, incorporate both the culture and the recreation. To get to make it to where we uh, fully fulfill the first bullet to get ever to get tribal citizens on tribal land. I think these are what we need. To, our tenants need to be for uh, our activities. I think that uh, uh, obviously uh, we can't uh, we can't issue a permit for one citizen to come in and, and dig up all of the blood root. That's that that's not proper. Uh, it has to promote the culture. We have to try to promote the, the, the economy of the area. Uh, obviously, people want our, our citizens want recreation, and uh, we need to provide those. Uh, I mentioned low-hanging fruit. Uh, last year, there was a seven-figure uh, grant opportunity available for some off-highway vehicle uh, recreational development. Uh, as I said, we couldn't get any traction last year, but. Uh, Hopefully, I believe that, that low-hanging fruit will come, will continue to come around. Uh, so all that I say that uh, I think we need to uh, to draft an outline of this uh, legislative vehicle, uh, and I think that it should uh, include uh, the strategy and the tenants as boilerplate, and uh, we uh, we hit the uh, the gathering rights. There's, there's a lot of places to get snake bit in here, particularly when you're talking about the commercial policies. Uh, but, but, but I think we can work through those. Uh, I think we have to incorporate the hunting and fishing code 
and maybe even begin drafting the uh, the, the regulations under the, that that particular law. And then uh, we have to tackle the recreational usage, which will once again be very sticky. Uh, uh, particularly if you look at our hunting and fishing code now, we have, for all intents and purposes, an Endangered Species Act. Uh, I have folks to you know that are wanting me to take species to uh, to Tom's Environmental Protection Council to get them added to that list. So I say all of this to once again let you guys know that. In, the vehicle for this needs to be comprehensive. I think we tackle everything in a very broad general area and then narrow down, and we could narrow down the gathering rights first, you know, if, if that was the wish of the council. But I think simply doing legislation just for gathering only that, 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 that completely leaves out the other areas, I think would be a mistake. So as I back up, once again, uh, draft the outline to include the uh, the, uh, the strategy, if I can get this to work. I think my batteries just went dead. Mr. Chair, may I ask a question? So you, you've identified that there are obviously federal barriers, so there's definitely the forestry plan, the forest management plan. Forest EIS. management plan, fire management plan, the integrated resource management plan, the agricultural management plan. So I didn't see a comprehensive list of just those as barriers because we'll need to do a work with Chief Baker's administration on the consultation that goes into those. And But I don't know that even if we were I mean, is that a consultation because it's an internal federal policy for those agencies, or is this going to be federal laws that we have to advocate? I don't think change? it's. It, I, I think it's federal policy, and basically, I think we can deal with the, with everything except the final approval through the regional office in Muskogee, uh, and uh, to jump through all of those hoops at one time, you can do an integrated resource management plan, an IRMP. You do that, have a recreation plan, a, a tribal lands policy, whatever you want to call it, as a rider to the IRMP, you negate having to jump through all those other hoops. So what do we need to do just to begin to take action? What can this body do? What's its first step and what's Chief Baker's administration's first step? I, uh, I think consultation between the executive branch and the legislative branch, you know, discussing these broad issues that I brought out in front of you and then drafting just a, a broad outline to throw in front of you that doesn't actually give you the rules, regulations, policies, and authorities, but details what areas we hit. I think that's the first step. But it sounds like you already have that outline. Can you provide that to us? Well, I, I have it very rough. I mean, it, uh, it's, it's not much cleaner than what you saw up there, but I can provide something that I think is the direction we need to go. I would appreciate that. I don't know if Councilman Keener has anything to add. but. Well, I don't think it's all going to be that simple. Once you get down to Kenwood and everywhere, those people ain't going to say what they all, you know. They're going to do what they please on tribal land. And, and, and I, th I think Councilman Snell's right. Uh, for example, uh, you know, for years, well, even today we have people call us and say, well, I'm not a tribal citizen, but I've hunted Kenwood my entire life. My grandfather hunted Kenwood the entire life. I'm hunting Kenwood myself, and if you want to send the marshals up to arrest me, that's what, that's what you're going to have to do. But, uh, you know, the alternative is doing nothing. So uh, uh, you have to begin to legislate somehow. Mr. Chairman, and, and I appreciate what you're saying. We'll never be able, I mean, we, but as a sovereign nation, I think it's important that we set up a legal framework uh, to protect those that need, we need to be moving forward for preservation of these areas, especially for some of these plants. In particular, um, I think the other things around it are part of it. Uh, but I've heard from our folks that do traditional gathering that we need these areas. We need them bigger areas to serve. Um, and I think our forestry management plan and the Bureau <coughs> Indian Affairs attitude towards ownership of our trees and those kind of things is paternalistic beyond belief uh, and needs to be stopped and it needs to be part of this overall issue and I think we would be remiss for not trying to address it even though we know that both there's some Cherokees but also non-Cherokees 
that are going to, they are, they will do whatever, regardless of what is in place. But I think there's a lot of people that are very interested in us doing something as a nation to move this forward. And for example, Curtis, I know that uh, we, we've always had problems with woodcutters and uh, how we've been able to kind of work with those, well, I'm going to do whatever I want to, is we, have, we now have our, our northern Kenwood manager, you know, go out to where we've got a right-of-way clearing project and say, you know, cut your wood here where we've already got to bull those down for you guys. And uh, we'll never have 100% compliance. I, I would hope that we could get, uh, you know, 75% compliance, but I, think, I still think that's a step in the right direction, particularly when, uh, as I said, the land base remains the static, the tribal population continues to get bigger, uh, and uh, we continue to have issues with underutilized lands uh, being, I don't want to use the word stolen, but I can't think of a better word right now. So. Yeah, yeah, um, have you checked into the federal government to see if we could get any grants for any phase of this uh, operation? Uh, I know there's, uh, I mentioned the low hanging fruit, uh, you mentioned off-road vehicles. It's a hot-button issue with a lot of people. Uh, however, uh, I'm a firm believer that you can have mixed use on on certain areas, and uh, there was there were, there was uh, over a million million dollars that I think that we would have been first in line for uh, early this spring had we been w ready, willing, and able to move on this. And. Uh, uh, Councilman Thornton, you know, I worked with that group that you had down there that was really trying to do some off-road vehicle work. And, uh, you know, their argument is, hey, you know, my blue card's just as blue as the guy who shoots deer. So uh, uh, I would really like to try to develop a comprehensive plan, get it out in front of our citizens to see if uh, they think this is the right direction. I think we owe them that. We need enforcement, you know, enforcement would be a key thing. But I can remember when they had the first deer city in Oklahoma, we still had the same problem as last deer city we had, you know. Mm -hmm. People coming and you don't tell me I came out over here. Yeah. You know? But enforcement is a, would be a key item. You know? it's, it's, it, it, it'll, it, it's, it's in the current game, and, uh, game code. It'll have to go in, the in uh, regarding ingress and egress. How do you get in to tribal lands? Yes. I would ask that we table further discussion on this until the next meeting. Uh, we're already out of time, and we've got to get ready for our council meeting. This is an extremely important issue, and it's going to take a lot of money just in the planning stages. So, and there's more than one department that's going to need to be involved with it, the Office Department, uh, the Marshal Service, the Attorney General's Office, it's bigger than just one one group, so I think it sure merits more discussion at a later date. I would make a motion that we table this. So at this time, I'll second with a friendly amendment to February, and I'll work with you as chairman to to make sure that we're better prepared for a more in-depth discussion, knowing that it's more complicated. I only accept a friendly if there's going to be more than one department involved in it because it's a multi-department I heard you situation. on that, yeah. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? You know, make a motion to adjourn. Say. Any announcements? <laughs> well, did I get all of your issues covered and let you know how it's complicated? I will, uh, I'll